Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast is brought to you by Compassion International. For $38 a month, you can release a child from poverty. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Your $38 a month sponsorship provides food, education, medical care, and vocational training, all done in Jesus' name, all done by the most trusted child development ministry in the world, an opportunity for you to release a child from poverty. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Today on the podcast, we welcome Brad Hertig to the show. Brad is an author and a motivational speaker. His book is called Find a Way, How a Water Bottle Took Me from Amputee to All State. Within months of losing both of his hands, Brad rejoined his high school football team and within a year and a half regained his starting linebacker position, led the team in tackles, and earned first team all Ohio honors. Brad's story, Brad's message is centered around an influential story that took place between himself and his football coach, and it's unbelievable how Brad was able to overcome and continue to overcome, even to today, the loss of both of his hands. And this is one of those stories that has a sports connection, certainly. Brad was a high school linebacker. But it's, it goes way beyond that. And his faith and trust in God in suffering as traumatic of an accident as you can suffer 17 years ago when Brad was just a teenager. And now he travels around the country last year, over 200 speaking events to tell those that will listen, including and mostly including teenagers the importance of faith, the importance of trust, the importance of finding a way, the importance of pushing forward, the importance for just living a life that is joyful, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And this is a really cool story with Brad Hertig. So let's hear our conversation with Brad on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Take a listen. Brad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jason. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to talk to you. I got to be honest with you. This is one of the few podcasts that I wasn't reaching out to the person to have on as a guest. It was somebody reaching out to me. In fact, it was you directly. And, uh, you know, I got to be honest with you. I didn't know a lot about you. So I'm going to learn about you in this podcast. But knowing your story and the research that I did, it's very inspiring. And I'm really looking forward to, to diving in and hearing all of it. But let's start with just getting to know you a little bit and your background growing up life is like as a kid. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, thank you. I, um, yeah, I just grew up in a typical Northwest Ohio home. Uh, we had mom and dad, I had three older brothers. And uh, in fact, my one older brother named Chris uh, entered our family a whole two minutes ahead of me. So I, I grew up with a, a twin brother. Nice. Uh, yeah, Chris was a great guy and, and is a great guy. And we did a lot of interesting things growing up. Uh, and yeah, we grew up, uh, my dad is a uh, like a Mr. Fix-It, Do-It-Yourself kind of guy. And so we learned a lot of things from him and we're just always active, doing things. Uh, we basically, when I was in eighth grade, we built our own house, actually. Mm. Uh, so just from that experience, just being outdoors, love riding uh, dirt bikes, ATVs, uh, all those types of things. Sports was a big part of my life as well. Um, so, yeah, I grew up with a good family and uh, good friends, good kind of a small community, uh, as you might think of. So Is faith a part of that as well, growing up? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so I, um, I basically grew up in the church. I, I don't remember when I wasn't involved in the church. I grew up um, in a, a local church. My mom and dad always woke me up, took me to church every Sunday morning, and yeah. uh, it wasn't until about high school that things really started to click more for me uh, personally in my faith and, and taking steps forward and and uh, not just uh, allowing God to seek me out, but seeking Him out. And yeah, and of course, there was a life changing experience for me as well uh, that really uh, catapulted me even further into knowing who God is in my life and, and what he wants for my life. 
We're talking to Brad Hertig on the Sports Spectrum podcast. You mentioned it, that life-changing experience. You travel all across the country now and sharing your story, uh, especially to high school kids. And I'll ask you later why that is so, uh, I guess, prominent of an audience and why you're passionate about talking to high school kids. But Tell us what happened. Let's let's get to you know one of the reasons why you're on this podcast, and certainly the the sort of platform that God has given you. Um, and it's it's crazy how He turns our tests into our testimonies, right? So tell us what happened to you, and uh, what led to losing both of your hands. Yeah. So for us, this is kind of a typical Sunday morning. Woke up uh, and went to church. After church, we actually headed over to my older brother's house. We were hanging out. We were over there to kind of clear some brush around his house, had a project he needed done. So we're helping out with that out in the sun all day working. And then uh, we ended up getting a call from a good friend of mine named Keenan. His dad owned a factory in town, and he was just calling to see if Chris and I would be interested in in working that night, third shift. Uh, We were kind of hesitant about that. You know, we had been up for 24 straight hours, and we had actually been, you know, working in the sun all day. So, we were kind of hesitant about all of this, and we also had a baseball game the next day. <laughs> and that was our biggest concern, actually, out of all of it. We didn't want to wake up, you know, trying to work through a night, come home, sleep all day, and, and then try to wake up and play that baseball game. And so we talked that through, and we thought, you know, we're going to be busy and active, and uh, we should be able to make it through the night, and we'll be surely tired enough that we'll sleep well enough during the day. Uh, and so we ended up calling our friend back and, and said we were in. And so we get home from our brothers, and we change our clothes, and uh, we take off for the factory that night, and we didn't know what we were going to be doing until we got there. We found out we would be operating a 500-ton power press, and I had no idea what that was, but basically it's this huge machine used to bend and form sheet metal into car parts, and I, you know, of course knew that this takes a lot of force, a lot of power to do that. Uh, in fact, when we pulled up to the factory, sitting in our cars out in the parking lot, we could feel the vibrations of when this press would come down and stamp the metal inside. And uh, that was just a sense of awe of this machine. And of course we walk in, we see this massive machine. It would expand, I don't know, expand somewhere 25 feet in the air, also another five or six feet down into uh, the cement. They cut out the cement. So it's a massive machine. And uh, it wasn't anything difficult that we had to do though. Uh, This is myself, my twin Chris, my good friend Keenan. We just had to move some pieces of metal. It was roughly the size of a piece of paper from one station of this press to the next. And there were four different stations. And so we developed a method where we would step up to the press and move the piece of metal. We'd step back. My friend Keenan, though, had to turn his back to the press so he could reach over to push the buttons. And that, of course, would activate it. Press would come down, stamp the metal, and then go back up. And so that process was working smoothly throughout the night. And we didn't have any issues until about halfway through. And it was like 2 o'clock in the morning where we moved the piece of metal. We stepped back. And as we did this, I noticed one of the pieces wasn't quite lined up right. Hmm. And so I, of course, knew that if the press would run, it was going to ruin that part. And so it was just an instinctive reaction to reach in to adjust the part but not knowing that my friend had already turned his back to the press to push the buttons. Hmm. And so as I'm reaching in, this 500-ton power press comes slamming down on both of my arms. And the first thing that I remember wasn't the physical pain or really even a physical sensation. The first thing that I remember was hearing someone else scream at what they saw when they looked at me. Hmm. And, you know, I had this terrible panicky feeling starting to come up within me and I knew this is not good. And how did this happen? And I quickly left the press and I I take off towards my boss. And of course, before I get to him, I decide in my head, I, I have to see how bad this is. And so I looked down and and it was not good. Half of my left hand was gone. The index finger was almost still attached. It was actually dangling down by some skin uh, or maybe a tendon or something. My left thumb was still intact though, but really unfortunately it was the only finger out of all 10. I looked to the right hand side and half of my arm was missing. 
about four inches below the elbow is actually where my arm ends. And, you know, I still remember looking down and, and just seeing that for the first time thinking, okay, I do not need to see that again. Yeah. I need to get to my boss and I get to him and he's in shock. Uh, he quickly leads me to his vehicle. We speed off to the hospital and it was a couple minutes down the road, but there was enough time for me to start to think. And I start to think about my life, how different it was going to be, yeah. how I'm never going to play sports again. And that was a really, really big deal to me. I uh, was a starting middle linebacker. I recently broke a school record as a sophomore uh, for tackles in a single season. And I just remember saying this out loud, I'm never going to play sports again. I'm never going to play sports again. Well, you know, here I was, three-sport athlete, starting middle linebacker, and now I don't have hands. Hmm. And so I so desperately wanted to go back you know, just a couple of minutes and change what just happened, but I couldn't. And so I, uh, we end up getting to the hospital, and uh, we didn't stay there long. I was actually life flighted from that first hospital, a, a local hospital, a smaller hospital. And so I was life flighted to a larger hospital to Toledo, Ohio, Ohio, and I stayed there for 11 days going through multiple surgeries. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of visitors, but I ended up coming home, and, and it was basically starting a new life without hands. And, uh, I mean, it's almost like where, where do you begin? How do you, how do you put these pieces back together, right? Yeah. Uh, and so there was a lot of pieces that did come together for me, and I think God was, of course, a big, a big part of that for me. And, um, you know, my coach was a big part of this, my family, my community really came around me. Um, but, uh, yeah, football was a big part of that recovery because obviously that was during the summer. Football was amping up, and uh, we're going into the fall, getting ready for a season. And my coach actually invited me out uh, to play football. <laughs> hmm. And I, I mean, I kind of thought he was crazy. Like, I mean, who, who plays football without hands? Right. But, uh, you know, I was like, you know, what else, what else are I doing? I, I'd love to be out on the team, you know, doing things. And so I, uh, I finally make it out there. It's like the end of July. So it was like really hot and muggy and I'm just sweating through my T-shirt. And I wasn't ready to practice yet. This was, this was about a month and a half after the accident. And so I'm just out there kind of watching the guys uh, go through there's some drills and things. And as I get thirsty, I would go to the trainers and I would ask them for a drink of water uh, naturally couldn't pick a water bottle up for myself. Yeah. And so they would pick a water bottle up. They would squirt it in my mouth and we had a really good system. And then at the end of practice, there's a water bottle sitting at my coach's feet. And you know, I was thirsty again and I saw that water bottle. And so I pointed out to the, to the coach that, Hey, can you pick the water bottle up? I'm thirsty. <laughs> well, instead my coach looks at the water bottle, looks up at me and then he thinks for a moment <laughs> And then he says something that would ultimately change my life. He said, if you're thirsty enough, you'll find a way. I was like, what? Uh, coach, I don't have hands. You have hands, right? I, I can't pick up this water bottle, you jerk. <laughs> right, right. I didn't say that out loud, right? I didn't have the courage, but uh, <laughs> certainly was thinking that. But he's like uh, – I wasn't budging. He was just standing there staring at me. And I'm like, he really is serious here. And it kind of clicks for me at that point. Like, wait a second. Like, I I can do this. <laughs> and so I kind of had this, like, I'll show you, coach. Uh, <laughs> so, so I dropped down on my knees. I, you know, and I didn't have prosthetics at the time. I mean, it was clear. but uh, And I can talk a little bit about these. But did have prosthetic hands. So I just had what ended at my arm down to the wrist and – my right arm that ends about four inches below the elbow. Yeah. So I drop down to my knees. I, I pick up this water bottle and between my two arms and I pull the cap and I squeeze it and I get a drink and I toss it back down to his feet with a big grin on my face. Like, yeah, uh, what's up now, coach? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he has this like proud father look on his, on his face. And, uh, that, but that was a big turning point for me. Uh, it was, it was really a, a paradigm shift from realizing, you know, if I can do this one thing, Maybe there are other things I can do that I'm not even trying. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was this mindset of I'm either going to find a way or I'm going to find an excuse. You know, I'm going to go after what I want unless it becomes too difficult. And then we, 
as you know, many times we'll just quit or if we're honest, we don't even try. And so this is a kind of an eye opening experience of, hey, I'm not helpless here. There are things I can do that uh, I need to kind of take ownership of and start to, to move forward with in my own life. So uh, that was a big shift for me and, and kind of paved the way for opening me up, come back and playing football again and uh, other sports uh, and in just life in general, uh, finding a way. That's awesome. There's so much to unpack there in, in that story. And, um, you know, for people who are listening on the podcast, I can actually see you, you're on video. So I can see, um, as you're describing this and, and certainly with the prosthetics on your, on your yeah. left and right arms too, there's a lot of questions I got, I want to ask, and I really want to ask some basic questions. Cause I, I was, you were 15, I think, right? Is this, this is after your sophomore year when this happened? Well, I had to actually just turn 17. 17. The, okay. I'm yep. sorry. So you were 17 when this happens. You know, yep. I, I had an injury playing basketball when I was 40 and I had, it, it sliced my two fingers apart and I had like 12, 13 stitches and uh -huh. my hand was basically my right hand was immobile for, we'll say two weeks. So I was complaining that taking a shower with one hand, I can't do this. It's one hand. And you're laughing because you had neither, but I'm, I'm complaining about getting a shower. It's very hard for me to drive. It's hard for me to put clothes on. And now I feel, um, just terrible even thinking that because knowing <laughs> what you went through, Brad, and still have to go through every day. Certainly you have prosthetics, sure. but let's go yeah. back to 17 year old Brad for a minute. Okay. In the aftermath. So you're in the car and, and, and the shock has kind of taken place. Mm -hmm. You go to the hospital and sort of what is the treatment on that? Are they stitching you up because your arms are yeah. gone? Are they trying to save? Do you have the, the hands, you know, to bring back and try to save? How did that work? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, they, of course, were trying to save everything that they could at that first hospital. And I remember as soon as I walked in, first thing the girl just literally screams out in horror. Mm. I mean, it's like, you know, two 30 in the morning, a little after two o'clock in the morning. And it's a small local hospital. So there's not a lot of activity. And to see someone walk in the door all of a sudden without limbs, yeah. uh, that was a, a very horrifying experience for her. And I end up meeting this girl later on uh, down the road when I was speaking actually. But, uh, so I walk in and I hear this, she just screams out and, and then she's like starting to point me down the hallway, down to this room. And so I run down there and then there's, one nurse, two nurse, three nurses, doctors, and then there's just a whole, it's almost like a active beehive. I'm just coming and going, coming and going yeah. of people. And they took these large scissors and cut my shirt up from the bottom up. And they're sticking me with needles on left side, right side, and all over. And someone's talking to me saying, we're going to do this next. We're going to do this. And, and then I also remember looking across and even seeing my boss um, who had driven me to the yeah. hospital, sitting there on the, the gurney in the hospital bed next to me. And, I mean, he just looked like a ghost. Hmm. I mean, just pale and he was rubbing his chin and I could, it was very clear. This was very heavy on his heart and watching me and experiencing all of this. And But you're coherent I, here, right? Like yeah, if you're fully, remembering yeah, all this, I mean, you're I, fully awake and yeah, remembering was, everything. Yeah, exactly. I, so I, often people ask, did you, did you pass out and yeah. what was this like? And I, I think I was still in a state of shock, but I, I clearly remember everything very well. Um, and then I know sometimes there's trauma and that you don't remember anything. And other times it's, it becomes actually the opposite where it's very vivid. Yeah. And for me, it was the vivid experience where I'm remembering all these details, but yeah, I remember that just, and part of this too, is I didn't, I wasn't feeling pain at the moment uh, or at least nothing as serious as you might think. Yeah. I think my body was still in a state of shock and the adrenaline rush and all of that. And so it felt like a very surreal moment for me in a dreamlike moment. And, and so I was just looking at him and seeing his face. And I remember having this, this sense of like, uh, I don't know, apathy for what he was dealing with and watching me as well. Like, hmm. you, you know, anytime you see someone in anguish, you know, that's not comfortable for us as people. And, right. and so I'm just remember seeing the, the details of his face and how hard it was for him to see this. Um, but anyway, doctor, doctors are working on me and, they're trying to get me stable. And they also, as you had asked about trying to salvage what they could. Yeah. So part of my left hand was still attached, as was mentioned. And they end up calling back to the to the factory saying, is there anything available? Uh, pieces of his hand, anything that can be salvaged. Yeah. And so my twin Chris actually goes back to the machine and pulls out pieces of my left hand that are st still there. Well, actually, it would be the right hand. Mm. Uh, 
because I was reaching in further with my right. So the last part of my fingers were just outside the machine. Yeah. Everything within the machine, it was 500 tons that came down. So there was literally nothing left. And everything within the machine was obliterated. But those fingertips was just outside that got cut off. And so he actually had a plastic bag they found and they put the fingers he did in the bag for the hospital. <laughs> and that's remark. I mean, I just, that still blows me away to think about <laughs> the courage of Chris going back to this machine, knowing he's going to try to pick up pieces of my hand. Yeah. Uh, just remarkable. So he does that and they run them back to the hospital. And it's not unfortunately anything they can really salvage from that. Uh, they do try to pin the index finger that was, uh, still somewhat attached right. and save that left thumb. Uh, in the weeks ahead, we find that the the hand isn't uh, the actually getting enough blood to it, so it actually turned black while I was in the hospital. And so, about uh, almost a month later, on July 9th, they end up amputating the rest of the left hand, and so now it's called a wrist disarticulation. So it actually ends where there's no wrist bones, but I have my full arm bones, radius and ulna on the left side. Okay. And it's still on the right arm, about four inches below the elbow. There's nothing changed there. Uh, so yeah, the hospital did what they could, but uh, that was uh, just, again, experiencing what Chris did and thinking about what he went through, but the courage of him to to face the machine and go back to that and and pick out those parts. I mean, that's just, uh, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's yeah, crazy. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So my other questions, I guess, would be, I want to ask you, first of all, because uh, I, I do want to talk about how you still came back and led the team in tackles without two hands, uh, playing starting linebacker, and you earned first team all Ohio in high school, which I thought was amazing. Um, but just the day-to-day, and you have prosthetic prosthetics on both arms, so was that something that happened pretty quickly so you were able to – put your clothes on and tie your shoes and even shower. I mean, just the basic yeah. things, brushing your teeth, things like that, even eating uh, and, yeah. and just being able to kind of go back to some sense of normalcy. How long did that kind of process take for you? Yeah. So that took a while. I actually, maybe oddly enough, got football pads to play football prior to getting prosthetic hands. Yeah. No, I hear you. <laughs> so <laughs> it, um, yeah. So the prosthetics, because they're so expensive and all of that, they they wanted to wait a little bit to get my arms healed up and for the swelling to go down. So when they fit the prosthetic, it's a, obviously a very skin tight. It's a cast. It's a mold of my arm. And so when you make that mold, you want it to be something that's going to last, and especially when you're paying so much for the prosthetics. And so they wanted to wait for the swelling to go down. So it was uh, the accident happened in June on June 10th, and it was about the end of August – where I started to get fit with the prosthetics. It was a process uh, until about November, end of October is when I actually received the prosthetics when I was able to take them home. So it was a process of getting fit and, and going back and forth and tighten this, loosen this, it's too tight, that sort of thing. So that period then without the prosthetics was a time of really leaning on my, my family. Yeah. I mean, they were just instrumental. Uh, <laughs> I, in a very humbly humble way, had to ask my mom and my parents to do things for me as a young man that I never thought I would have to ask them to do. I understand. Uh, going to the <laughs> showering, you know, all these types of personal, very personal type of things that I was having to ask them because I, I could not do it on my own. Uh, now that, of course, uh, as over time, even without prosthetics, I, I learned to adapt. My arms were not as sensitive that I could start to do things for myself. Um, and so I got to a point where I was able to do some of those things, even eating uh, without a prosthetic. I actually – Velcro became my best friend. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I would Velcro anything and everything to my arms, uh, mostly my left arm because it had still some length to it. And so I had like a little Velcro strap that uh, we would have a little slot in it. So I would actually stick a like a fork in there or a knife or a spoon or whatever so I could actually still eat with that. Uh, then I would take this, that out. I would stick like a pencil in there or reverse it and have the eraser stick out. So I'd actually type with that then. So it just was a, a great uh, little device I would use. And so Velcro was a great thing. It helped me do things. Tying shoes, I still relied on others to do until I got the prosthetics. Yeah. But I did start to adapt. And that's, I think, a natural thing within us as, as people. We, we often adapt without even realizing it. But then at times we have to be very intentional in, in adapting and finding what I call a new normal. Uh, 
and so I, you know, obviously I had to take different attempts and many different uh, processes of trying things out and failing and trying again and just sticking with it over time. But yeah, once I got the prosthetics, it still took, I always say about two years before I really got comfortable with the prosthetics and, and learned to use them well and, and able to pick things up with just basically not thinking about it, just grabbing things now. Uh, but I, yeah, I, it was, uh, yeah, still a learning process with the prosthetics and, and, uh, took a lot of patience, you know, cause you're, cause I don't have any feeling in my hands. And so I'm picking things up and I don't, I have to see it when I'm picking it up and yeah. all of that. But what I don't year, get what year was the accident, Brad? Yeah, it was June 10th, 2002. 2002. So it's been, it's almost 17 years now, uh, yeah. since the accident, which is probably kind of crazy on your end too, to think how long ago that was. Um, it is. God has done a lot in your life, obviously, but I wonder, because you were so young, how has your faith uh, grown? And you said it it really kind of took a different meaning to you after the accident. So tell me about going deeper with God and kind of exploring, because a lot of people in an accident like this might look at it and say, God, why would you do something like this to me? Like, why me? What are you doing? And in many cases, even question if there is a God, if he would allow something like this to happen to you. For you, yeah. though, tell, take us inside your faith and kind of how that's grown over the years now, 17 years later. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, so faith has been an instrumental, instrumental part of this journey for me and who God is and what he's done for me and the hope that he provides. Uh, but, yeah, certainly early on um, there was those questions of, of why. And I, I didn't typically go there. Uh, I, I always had the mindset of move forward. I cannot let the past dictate my future. Yeah. And I knew just dwelling on what I didn't have would cause me to be stuck there. And I would become bitter. I would become angry. But at the same time, I knew, like, why would I want to be that? I, I've seen other people experience traumatic incidences. And and it, it seems to be, like you said, painted well, two outcomes. It, it either becomes a, a situation where they are just in a tailspin and their life is a mess and no one wants to be around them or people have had tried to help them, but they just they're not willing to help themselves either. And yet you've seen other people where it almost seems to be a catalyst for them, where they they become stronger, they become better. Uh, and and I, I've seen that example. And I and I think to myself, well, like, why not me as well? Like, why? Why focus on what I don't have? And so I think that's such a I think a key thing for any of us, really, in that when we have something difficult, it's it's focusing on what we do have versus what we don't have, mm. uh, because when we do that, we then have something to work with. We uh, and so with that, nonetheless, I, I, I see how God was working and, and providing even in the the early stages. I remember being waking up and and really just being thankful to God for what I had, you know, I, and it's so I think it's so easy to, again, focus on what we don't have. And I could be angry at God and say, God, what? you took my hands, you know, I, who are you? You're loving God. What is this? This is not loving. Yeah. But at the same time, first off, did God really take my hands? <laughs> right. uh, you know? And so I think sometimes we can blame God for things that he didn't intentionally do or cause to happen, but nonetheless, he did allow it to happen. I believe God is completely sovereign in our lives. And I think that's a good thing uh, that he is sovereign. But for me, he was a source of, of courage, encouragement and hope that it was, it was it was odd for me to try to be like feeling angry at God, but at the same time, go to him and ask him for help. <laughs> like it didn't that didn't work for me. Like I, I the rug was pulled out from under me yeah. and I was laying on my back. I had nowhere to go but up and I needed him in my life. And so he was a source of encouragement for me to go to. And and so we, I just have conversations with God. God, I don't I don't understand why this happened. I, I don't. But I know that you're good, and I know that I need you. And if I'm ever going to get over this or overcome this, it's going to be because of you in my life. Uh, and so I remember just going for different walks, one specific walk. I remember walking through the woods that we have and, and just looking up at the creation and, and just seeing, wow, this is so beautiful. And I remember thinking, God, I still have legs. I, I'm still able to be present here walking, enjoying this. Yeah. Uh, and I remember just waking up and, and feeling thankful that I, again, have legs to to walk out of my bed. Not everyone can do that. And so having that mindset of, of thankfulness of what we have versus what we don't have, I think, can channel us in a way that helps us overcome. And 
And I think it's specifically to God. Uh, the God has given us all things. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And so recognizing where that gift comes from, it's not just a general thankfulness. It's a direct thankfulness to who God is and what he's done in our lives, yeah. even in spite of tragedies. Yeah. And so with that initial mindset, I think that a lot comes from where my parents came from and, and who they brought me up to be and right perspective of who God is, that he's always good. Um, and so I've, I've seen that uh, even in spite of tragedy, that God is good. And so through my family of different supports that they've done, and there's a verse that always stuck out to me, First John 4, 18, mm-hmm. actually, because I could never really, I could never put into words what my family has meant to me and the people in my lives uh, and, and how they've, in my life and how they've helped me and supported me and done things for me. But there it says that the perfect love drives out fear, mm-hmm. that the perfect love casts out fear. And so how I saw that at work in my own life was that through my family's unconditional love, because there were many things I was not able to do, many things I was not able to do for them, but yet here they are loving me, doing these different things for me unconditionally, just meeting these different needs. It was then driving out the fear in my life. Like I didn't I didn't have to worry about, well, how am I going to take care of this? How am I going to do that? They were meeting those needs through their love and therefore driving out the fear. And and yet at the same time, I you know consider that verse and I realize I don't love my family perfectly and my family doesn't love me perfectly. But how much more does God love us and how much more pure and powerful is that love and how much more should that be driving out the fear in our lives? And so going to him and, and finding that constant love that God does not withdraw, he does not pull back, even in spite of our messes, though instead he actually seeks us out and walks us through those messes uh, in life. And, you know, how good is God? I mean, that's just, I I don't, there's not a person uh, that would, would just ultimately seek us out in ways that he does. And so I have felt blessed and and felt very encouraged uh, by God and his love and uh, continually to work these things out and and provide different opportunities. Uh, football was one of those, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Prosthetics. Yeah. I don't feel I don't feel you know like I should have these things, but at the same time I feel very fortunate. Uh, the prosthetic hands are amazing. They enable me to do a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, there was that that still that you know why you know that kind of why God did you let this happen and and yet I think He worked things out um, in His timing. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not our own timing. And at the same time, I think he, as he says in his word, he works all things for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And I think we all have a purpose. He's given us a purpose. Uh, I think a lot of that good, though, isn't what oftentimes the world likes to paint of this huge success or you get the the picket fence and the, the brand new car and all this the nice home. Um, that's often what we would desire. But what God says is the good is more of what Jesus looks like. Yeah. And uh, then I think that's what he does is he takes tragedy. He uses it as a rope and he pulls us to him through it. Now we can fight him on that, uh, but he's a loving father and he'll work with us. He'll give us space, but he wants to all ultimately draw us to his heart, draw us to him and um, really make us more into the image of his son, which is ultimately the best version of ourselves. And, and who God has called us to be. So That's I've good. seen how God has, has, has worked through this and has done a lot for sure. All right. So a couple more questions here with Brad Hertig. How do you play football without hands? Yeah. <laughs> and how do you actually know, be really good at it and make lots of tackles? Your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I didn't have the prosthetic hands for football. I wasn't allowed to use them. They would easily break. And they're also made of metal, the hands. And so the referees are a little concerned I would use them as a club yeah. and start beating people to death. <laughs> so I was not allowed to use that. Uh, and, of course, I would never beat someone to death, right? Of course not. <laughs> uh, so I had to actually use foam pads, uh, which is a plastic mold of my arm, and there's one-inch foam wrapped around that plastic mold. And I would literally <clears throat> have those foam pads taped to my arms, and I'd go out and play like that. Now, of course, that was a challenge in that – I didn't have hands to make a tackle, but at the same time, if you've played football or if anyone has, you you know when you're tackling somebody, your approach isn't to use arms and hands. Well, you use your arms to wrap, but your hands. 
um, that was what they would call an arm tackle. And that's what they would say, no, you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to wrap with your arms. So you go low, you drive with your shoulder and wrap with your arms. And so for me, it became just a thing where I had to be more disciplined. I had to be in a better position. I had to stay low. I had to keep my feet under me. If any time I was trying to lean out and reach for an arm tackle or hand tackle, I wasn't going to get that typically. Uh, I had to be in better position. I had to stay low and drive with my shoulder, wrap with my arms, and it still works. I mean, I, 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 I made, uh, you know, like you mentioned, 111 tackles my senior year. But at the same time, there were plenty of tackles I did miss uh, that uh, I did have a you know wrap up that the quarterback ran through my arms or the running back did. And so those are moments of frustration. But, you know, you, you still had to be uh, sticking with it and keeping the right mindset that, hey, I'm out here. I've I've in a sense earned this position back and coach believes in me. And if he doesn't, he's going to put someone else in. So yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, that's, so. that's great, and it's awesome. It's an awesome story that you, you were able to come back and obviously be an inspiration that way. But now, as we fast forward to to today in 2019, you are a speaker, an inspirational speaker, motivational speaker, whatever that term is, and an author as well. So your story's out there as opposed to uh, just kind of you going through whatever you're going through by yourself. It's out there. Your ESPN and the New York Times have done stories on you as well back then. But now you're you're out there talking to people and and making a difference and sharing your story. And I'm just curious, is there one story you can share of someone that's been affected by hearing your journey? Because I think there is always though to me that's when God confirms, you know, why we went through what we went through, right? And I wrote a book and I have a story to tell. And when I go and share it, then somebody comes and tells me what they're going through, and I realize, okay, God, this is why you had me here to tell my story of my life. How is that yeah. for you? Is there a story you can share? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, in similar to what you're sharing, there are a lot of them. I mean, it's, I feel very fortunate and often reminded that God is using this story for good. And it's not so much that I've done something special. It's just that God is using something, the brokenness and he brings it together and makes a complete picture again. Yeah. Um, different than what I would have anticipated for my life, but nonetheless, it's it's good, and yeah. because God is good, and so, um, well, actually, I guess uh, just a recent one. I'll just do that. Yeah. So I have social media that, that people are reaching out to me, and after I I speak, and sometimes they don't feel comfortable coming up to me afterwards. They it's just uh, this age, uh, the kids are typically more comfortable with their phones and interacting that way. So, anyways, yeah. I have a um, uh, an Instagram. A, a young girl was was sharing with her and, and she just recently said, Hey, you know, I, your message is spot on. It's encouraging me. I, and she shared her story of, of not having a dad in her life. And, um, she had lost, uh, her grandmother who was really close to her. Uh, and she was going on to the different losses that she's had and she's struggling with her own identity. Uh, she's just struggling with her friendships and, uh, she's like, Brad, what, what, what's motivating you? What's keeping you going? What you shared tonight is something that I need in my life. And I, I want to have that peace that you have. Uh, this was actually specifically in a moment that I had the opportunity to share the gospel at an evening concert. Hmm. And so she wanted to more, de- more details about that. And, and so for me, having those opportunities of, of individuals knowing not just the part of the story, which is the, uh, the wonderful comeback story. That's all is great. Yeah. But the ultimate source of it, which is the whole story and what God has done and how he has brought peace to my life. Um, knowing that this is not my eternal home it is great as the world can be and as awful as it is at the same time. But God has redeemed us as a people from this place. Uh, he's called us to be light bearers, to, to shine into the darkness and so we're these moments of discouragement in the world that other people have. We all have them, but we can go into these places and these um, people's lives and share our stories of encouragement and say, hey, there's a better way. And there's the, there's there's something that God's called you to. Um, don't don't lose hope in this situation that's discouraging you. And so I, I, I feel fortunate to be able to to share the story where there is hope. You know, we we see so many stories of where there's tragedy and that's all we hear. We just hear the tragedy. We never hear the other side of it. Um, But to give someone hope. Hmm. Does the prosthetics 
hinder th- how you travel? I'm just thinking, you know, going through security <laughs> and, and fingerprinting <laughs> and things like that. Like, does that, sure. is that yeah. something you have to kind of go through a special security area or have clearance or something? How does that all work? Uh, yeah. So when I fly, it's not anything special. Uh, I do have pre TSA approved, but that doesn't really change a whole lot for me. Right. Uh, but I would go through the security scanners as everyone else does. Once I walk through, of course, it sends them off, uh, the metal detectors, that is. And so they get a little wand out. They they scan my arms, and it sends the wand off as well. I'm like, yeah, it's made of metal. It's going to. Uh, and so they yeah. then take a little, like, uh, swab test of my arms. And I, and I don't know if it's just explosive. Maybe it's narcotics as well, but they're testing for yeah. different uh, drugs and maybe explosives as well at the same time to, to scan those different parts of my arms. Does that happen every that time? Stick. It is every time. Wow. Yep. So you almost have so, to plan for that extra <laughs> extra few minutes, right? Yeah, it's, it's actually not bad. I mean, usually the, the guy – so they, they call their mail assist and they come over and – uh, and it's usually not, it, it's literally maybe two extra minutes yeah. that I have to go through. Okay. So it's, it's really not too bad. They don't, um, depending on the airport, it has been where they actually want to like take me to another room and do like a pat down type of thing. Yeah. But I, that's only happened once. So I don't know if that was just, there was extra security going on at heightened security risk or something. They had to be extra careful. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, yeah so the security is not too bad driving. I drive a car with the prosthetics, not an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can even drive a manual. So yeah, the travel isn't bad with the prosthetics. What does hinder things is when I have a breakdown. So they do break often. I'm, if I can say it still hands on. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I like to still be active and doing things. So when I have a prosthetic break, then it, it slows me down a little bit. I'm able to still, I mean, even tie a shoe with one arm uh, yeah. working, it, it still works and takes me a little bit longer. But yeah. so yeah, I'm still, I, I travel on my own. So um, the curiosity yeah, was, peaks me always. So what about sleeping? Do you have to take them off at night before you go to bed and certainly showering and things like that? Yes, I do. Yep. Yeah. So I wear them. It's basically one of the first things I do in the morning is put them on. So I kind of have a routine. I have a devotional time and workout and then I shower, especially when I'm off the road, I can do all those. But, um, when I'm, uh, then I want to shower, I put them on mm-hmm. and then I wear them all day. And it's pretty much the last thing I take off mm-hmm. at night. Interesting. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, it's been great to have you on here, Brad. Really appreciate you joining us. The last question I always ask is, uh, to all of our guests is what is the Lord teaching you right now? So it's, it's been 17 years and, uh-huh. Um, you know, you've been a, a believer for almost all your life. So where you are in this season of life right now, as you're getting ready to write a second book, what's the Lord been showing you? What's be, what's he been teaching you? Yeah. Uh, well, I think a lot of what the second book is about and that's finding our true treasure is him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as I get the opportunity to stand on hundreds and thousands of stages and speak to thousands of people and, and in some ways that can look very glamorous, uh, but in the same time, that can be very empty. Sure. Uh, and so seeking out the right things and finding my true treasure in God and who he is in my life as my rock and my hope and my salvation, uh, that it's not in this false uh, sense of glamour that, you know, I'm this speaker that gets to, you know, impact thousands of lives. But it's it's reaching for who God is in my life and continue to seek his heart out and being obedient to him. Um, so I, th- I think, yeah, just treasuring him above and beyond my role. Uh, he's called me to, I believe he's called me to here now at this moment uh, and to recognize the true value of, of who he is over and above my career uh, and not letting that uh, get out of proportion. So he is uh, Brad Hertig. His book is called find a way how a water bottle took me from amputee to all state. He's an author, of course, and a motivational speaker. Brad, it's been great to have you here on the podcast. Thanks for joining us and uh, wish you nothing but the best, man. Continued success. Great. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Really good stuff there from Brad Hertig on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Appreciate his heart and his ability and willingness to tell his story, knowing that his story can help and influence others in a positive way. I love the motto, if you're thirsty enough, you'll find Away Again, Brad's book is called Find a Way, How a Water Bottle Took Me from Amputee to All State. You can find that on Amazon. You can also check it out on his website, bradhertig.com, H-U-R-T-I-G. 
bradhertig.com and follow him on Instagram at the Brad Hertig. He posts a lot of clips and videos of his speaking engagements, mostly with high school uh, kids and in high schools. And I like that he speaks to high school kids. Man, those are our future, those kids, and they need to hear messages that life isn't all fun and games and, and bad things happen, but it's what we do in the midst of those circumstances, those bad things, those trials that come our way that really defines us and shapes us. And so grateful to Brad for coming on the podcast and really appreciate him sharing his story here on Sports Spectrum. We also want to thank our sponsors, Compassion International. $38 a month gets you a chance to release a child from poverty. It's the best $38 that you'll spend every single month. And we all want to make a difference. We all want to find a way to help others, to serve others. But what about releasing a child from poverty? A child that's across the other side of the world and is just struggling. The basic necessities of food, education, medical care, vocational training, schooling, all done in Jesus' name. They don't have those unless a sponsor comes through and helps release that child from poverty. And that's where you and I can come in and make that difference. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Thanks for listening, and we appreciate you always checking us out on social media at sports underscore spectrum on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also check out our website, sportspectrum.com. There are great articles and content available every day over at sportspectrum.com, and you can also subscribe to our magazine. 18 bucks for an entire year gets you our Sports Spectrum magazine. This ministry founded, and really the pillar of this ministry comes from the magazine that came out over 30 years ago and is still going strong today. Check it out. Subscribe today, sportspectrum.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Have a great rest of your day.